it grew on me the the practical handling of art looking at objects making sure that they are authentic all this was something i had never trained for so it became very intriguing and i said this is fun you know and instead of just dry art history as living with objects and in a sense you know we all have this collecting instinct but unless you are rich you can't collect but as a museum curator you can do both you can study and collect and it's being of a scholarly aptitude i always wrote a lot yeah you see how, how many uh, oh i mean you know books and catalogs are maybe 70 or more <laughs> it was very impressive when i i saw your short biography yeah yeah professor paul in in your in your opinion regarding this uh, almost 50 years of uh, creating heart what changes in when you started to do the the uh, you took the job in boston and now what changed in the oh creating? enormous enormous first of all you know in boston we it was an easy thing if you had money you went to dealers and all you had to do is make sure that the object was not stolen or removed illegally from a monument and you could for instance you know then it wasn't easy but because you had to have you had to find money you had to impress the board of trustees you see american museums operate in a much different way than i remember when i started european museums hardly bought anything then you see if europe hadn't gone to asia and africa and other places and plundered them in colonial times europe would have had no art of non european cultures america didn't do that they had to buy because european museums were mostly state museums i and they were not uh, except for a few like the london museums and the gimme uh and i guess the reedberg these were quite active because they had their uh they were founded with good big collections and they continued they gave some money and they used to be able to buy come but the competition was mostly in america except then japan became japanese became interested in the art of gandhara only one area the northwest which is now in pakistan so they bought a lot of that but otherwise america was the market but you know the job was you had to grow into the job you see in, in although i did two phd's but my expertise only was in art history but in, and a university professor all he needs to know is art history and he can go and lecture but as a museum curator my job entailed fundraising administration doing exhibitions university professors didn't do exhibitions then so that was another process of learning you see i had enormous opportunity to learn because to do an exhibition by borrowing from other museums and collectors i had to know those collections also well not just my whereas my colleagues here in european museums only looked after their collection because they never did big shows this in europe this is recent really i mean in terms of in the 70s and 80s and all they didn't only now they are going out and getting exhibitions from other countries or of course you see a museum in europe which is state run is totally different 
from American museums, say, which are privately run. It means that you have to give some... Completely different. There you have got a board of trustees. Here you work only for the director. You see? And then the collectors are much more aggressive in America. They work in tandem with the curators, you see, and their collections. So you build up private collections in America. How many curators in Europe do that? No. So do, do you think that it would be a good thing for European, uh, European uh, curators, museums, to be a little more open? Oh, much, of course, they have to be. Because that's how the money comes in also. See, where is the money going to? Why would anyone give money to a museum run wholly by a state or a municipality or something? No. You see, now the museum where I worked for 25 years is a county museum. It is a government museum, but this is the beauty of America that the government doesn't run it. They give support to it and say now, and then you have a private board of trustees which is self-appointed. They don't appoint, so there's no politics coming in. You see, the minute you have a government-run institution, then government changes every five years. Okay, so today it's the Labour government, tomorrow it's the Liberal and the after tomorrow Conservative. So conservatives will have their views and impose their views on a museum. But you can't do that in an American museum. That's the beauty. But the curator also has direct access to, say, the collectors who are on the board. I cultivate. I go and look for works of art for them. I tell them that this object I found and I want it for the museum and you must help me get it. Otherwise, you won't get free advice from me. Oh, you mean that it's some kind of exchange? Unwritten. But it is. It's a give and take. Why should I otherwise? I'm working, say, for an institution which is semi-private only which is partly funded by a government organization and partly by private support. So this private-public partnership is, I think, an extraordinarily good idea of which there should be more in countries, not only in Europe, but in India and elsewhere. Well, you, you, you just mentioned India. How is the situation? I mean, how is the situation in India regarding Indian art and museum and... Terrible. The situation in India is bad because in India also, most governments, most museums are government run. And the Indian government is far less enlightened than, than say, European governments. There's too much interference. Here there's less interference, you see. I mean, the French government, I mean Mitterrand, for instance, helped build some of the great museums of Paris. And then he let it be run, more or less. They gave money. Like the National Gallery of uh, Washington is actually funded by Congress but managed by a separate trustee and they do. This is very interesting because you, you know all these uh, uh, hot, uh, hot topics now about uh, to give back, I mean oh. um, archaeology etc. But this is my point of view, but maybe we can, we can discuss it yes. now a little it's bit It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The, my feeling is that, I mean, when I was a young kid, I went to the Louvre, I went to the British Museum and things, I went, it was so amazing, but all this was stolen or given by collectors. Uh, but I remember the history of Angkor, uh, the Temple of Angkor, and I said, yeah, but this was completely uh, eaten, by, eaten by the jungle. Yeah, 
So if people didn't stole it, this would stay and they, nobody will, will have a clue about it. So what is the balance for you between this? Should yeah, but you see, sure, the French saved, you might say, and also uh, made this art better known in the world, in the Western world. And as a matter of fact, uh, the Cambodians, even after independence, very few Cambodians showed any interest in their own art or culture. Their rich people don't go out and form a collection. India is a little better that way now. There is more Indians and Indians were collecting already in the colonial days. India collect. I've just written a big article on the history of collecting in India from about 1890 to 1947 when India got independence. Amazing how many people collected then, the rich, the Tatas, you know, the name today, Tatas and all, they're all collectors. And even lesser people you don't know. You know, dozens of Indians collected. Now, today we have, India's population is 1.2 billion. Okay? Do you know, I for 20 years, I was, last 20 years, I was the editor of the major art magazine published in India called Marg. Okay? You'll see it in my VT. And there are now billionaires in India, not rupee billionaires, dollar billionaires. They're in the Forbes list of billionaires, you know. But you want to know how many people subscribe to the magazine? 1,500. That's 1.2 1 billion people and 1,600 Quarterly magazine. Why? why? Well, what do you mean? Why? why? I why? don't know. This is this is a, you know, at least the Chinese, uh, you know, despite all the fact that we may not like the Chinese government, present government, and their communistic policies, but look what the Chinese have done to the market, Chinese market now. Because they they, they took it as a because price. they are really genuinely China always was into you see a pre collecting is a new concept in a sense in India it came with Western and you said that yes Cambodian temples Angkor Wat and all were all gobbled up by the jungle and the French saved them true Similarly, you see, we also learned the appreciation of ancient art from because of the British education system. So let's take this trouble right now with this Cambodian sculpture. Okay. First of all, you see the UNESCO law, in my opinion, is again ridiculous and arbitrary that everything before 1970 or whatever that date is kosher, but everything after 70, you have to prove that it came out of country of origin and all that. Why, I don't know why they chose this arbitrary date. By that token, uh, Andre Malraux and the French looted Cambodia and brought all that stuff which are in the Gimme, then technically all that should go back. But if it went back, first of all, it won't even be restored to the monuments. Even now they can't put them back. Okay, number one. So anyway, so Gimme gets away with all that or other people who bought before 70. And suddenly, everything after that becomes illegal. Even if they belong to a private collector who sold it. True, smuggling is involved. I'm not going into that. But that's because 
they don't have a sensible policy of exporting. If they had a sensible policy like Japan, where you know, the real treasures they keep back and allow things to go, but that they don't do. If they want something back, you have to come to some understanding with them that let's be reasonable about it because you can't deny it. I'll tell you what happened to me. Once, back in the 70s, I was asked to be on a panel to meet a group of international students visiting from all over the world. They were brought, they were all 16 to 20 years old. You know, senior school students, more or less. So I met them as the only I was chosen because I was from India and the other two were white Americans. The so three of us were on a panel and these were us sitting. So question and answers were going on. And uh, an African, I don't remember boy, I don't remember from which country now, Nigeria or somewhere, uh, got up and said to me, but it's all wrong, you see, these all belong to our cultures and they're our cultural heritage and, you know, they should all send back to us, they should be sent back to us. Now, this is the 70s, you know, so I said to them, look, you know, if people come and rob from your monuments, etc., then that's wrong, but you have to guard them and you have to make certain that people can't rob your heritage. Now I said, so this boy, you know, so I told him, I said, look, I said, you know, I know a very famous Benin bronze. I first said to him, I said, you know Benin? You know, so he had at least heard of Benin. He said, yeah. I said, I don't know if he had heard of it even. I said, was returned from Europe. What happened? Two years later, it was back on the market. So you know what his argument to me was? He said, so what? It's our national thing. We can do what you, you want with it. I said, no, it's just not your national thing. Once you've created a work of art, it can stay in your place, but everyone in the world has a right to admire it. I said, I was in Nepal in 1950s and before my eyes, I was taking some photographs of some sculptures lying on the ground. And these little boys, you know, they come around you, they're curious, those, they, you know, so these boys are all giggling and they said, look at this funny Indian taking pictures of this piece lying there. A stone sculpture, it's 7th, 8th century sculpture, you know. So you know what he did right in front of me? He started hitting the sculpture with a stick in his hand. I said, oh, what are you doing? You know, I said, you're going to destroy the nose and the, you know, this and that. So I told these guys the story. I said, you know, I, you know. I said, the little boy got frightened. He laughed and he went away and I saved that for, but probably he's gone now. It's broken somewhere. It's, so you know this word, the African, again he said, he said, if the Nepalese wants to destroy his own heritage, that's his problem. Now, how am I going to answer this? True? Do you, don't you think it's just political? Of course it's political. And it's, look at, take for instance China and Tibet. Huh? China claims Tibet has always been a part of China. Hmm? Have you ever seen a Chinese show that includes any Tibetan work? No. Culturally, they don't rec recognize Chinese uh, Tibetan culture. Why? If it's part of integral part of China, this claim from 8th century, you know, then fine. But why is it only Chinese literati paintings and Chinese ceramics? and Chinese this, you see there is a distinction. You go, no Chinese art historian really studies Tibetan art. 
In all museums today, Tibetan art is considered basically of the Indian collection. Okay? Gime? Even in Gime, technically, Tibetan art is a separate department. In American Los Angeles, I was for 25 years curator of Indian art. That was my title. But I had India, Southeast Asia, Tibet, Nepal, all this was under me. No Chinese art historian, even in the West, in America or Europe, will take Tibetan department over if you hand it to them. First of all, art, we shouldn't bring in politics. Why should this art story not have the important? This is the society in which you are living and then suddenly one sculpture over one sculpture, look at New York Times article. Up. Now, Metropolitan suddenly unilaterally announces doesn't talk with any other museums or anything that let's have a common policy, what we can keep, what we... I mean, after all, even if bought a Michelangelo or a Leonardo or whatever is an Italian treasure, is America going to give back every Italian treasure they have? But that guy who made a big fuss with Getty, you see, the West has lost his moorings. In fact, I'll give you my last three years. Ten sculptures from the roof of a ceiling of an Indian temple, guarded by a permanent keeper, employed by the Archaeological Survey of India. <coughs> okay? Disappeared. Ten, all ten of them were lost, came, all came out, they were all in the market, over ten years they were sold, people bought them, and I have found five of them, <coughs> and the private collector and one, one is the dealer. You know, when I explained to them what they were and all that, they all agreed Five I haven't found yet, but these three people concerned, two collectors, one dealer, they said, you know, fine, we'll give them back. They didn't even, you know, the collectors didn't care about money, their money, getting money back. The dealer, had, one dealer had sold three. He went to collect the two collectors immediately gave him back the piece. One collector wouldn't give him back. So he bought the sculpture back. That's tough, you know, a dealer. Yeah, he bought the sculpture back and they, do you know? Three of them are sitting boxed up in this city. This city of yours. And two are in America. I have gone all the way up to the Minister of Culture in India for the last three years, given up. I can't return them. Because they don't want to get involved. The politics is such that the present minister, you know, the ministers don't care. But they have this antiquities law in India that they want things back and they're giving trouble to one dealer now, you know, making and that dealer really I didn't have it. But here I want, and I'm saying this and maybe someone will see it and I'll become a person on grata with the government of India. But, so where do we stand? Do you want your heritage back? If you don't, you are not, if it takes me three years and I still, I've given up now, I've written and that Minister has gone, twice the minister has changed, the secretary of culture has gone, retired. <laughs> so how do I give it back? So do, do you mean that there is some kind of a very large common uh, UNESCO resolution or whatsoever laws on one hand, but when 
physically you want to make it happen, it doesn't work. But it was not like that in the 70s. I have returned five sculptures to India, two to Nepal. In the 70s, it was much easier. I used to just write to the Director General of Archaeology Survey of India and tell him this I found. He said, fine. Ship it back. And that was the end of it. But of course, once it goes back, it never gets back on the monument. You see, one was a sculpture removed from a temple. And where, where does it go? It's sitting in a storage in the Archaeological Survey of India, now for 20, 30, 40, 40 years almost, 40 years. Dr. Paul, this is uh, a talk, and uh, uh, it's uh, a talk that we have with Olga, with dealers, with scholars quite, quite often. Uh, for me, when I was a, a kid, for me, art was not was a person, the, a maker, and wa was not belonging to, uh, could belong to a style, but not belong to a state, especially regarding the fact that borders change quite a lot, that we all forget. Uh, but do, do you think that art is national? First of all, what constitutes a na nation? What is national? Is only the people who speak French? Hmm? For example, who are a state? Okay, let's oh, take yeah. France. For example. France, yeah. basically basic heritage is their Christian culture. The art is Christian. Hmm? But now, you've got many others living in France who practice other religions. Some of those religions consider the Christian imagery to be heathen. Okay. They don't accept it. So is it, but they're French? Is it their heritage? It's not. So what is happening to the nation of France? Indian nation is a, an artificial nation created as only in 47. The subcontinent that was India is split up now into Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. Okay. Pakistan is declared an Islamic state has been. Bangladesh is an Islamic state. And yet Islam doesn't accept representational statuary of God or gods. How do you recon reconcile all this? Okay. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, were all created by the so-called smart Europeans only in the 1920s after the fall of Ottoman Empire. They were before that part of, there was no Jordan, there was no, they were part of an empire that originated in Turkey. Right? So these are now nations. So what's happening to that nation? Why is the Syrian president killing his own people, slaughtering them every day? Is that one nation? So my question is, what is the nation? What constitutes the nation? You, 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 fo you follow the lead very, very well, because no. that, that's the point. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's point. the point. So therefore, art is, in a, is just a, you know, if you think about the importance of society and this and that, I mean, we are fighting over, I mean, so therefore, by definition, if nations are artificial creations, there is no national art. 
It's all global. It's mankind's heritage. It's not yours or mine, it's mankind's heritage. All of us have a right to admire. You see, only thing is tangible because it's a tangible material object. You are fighting over it. And now only why? Because the value has become great. Okay, astronomical. 